You are listening to another No Fair Remembering Stuff, the Tuesday edition of the Professional Left Podcast, and available wherever you get your podcasts and at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at the Professional Left Podcast, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And it's not safe for work. In this episode, we are marking the 20th anniversary of the United States invasion of Iraq. This is not going to be a history of U.S. foreign policy, although we will talk about history, and it's not meant to be a definitive timeline of events leading up to the invasion of Iraq and the aftermath. We realize we're courting the disapproval of the Internet's But You Forgot About Brigade, and we're fine with that. We've been doing that since 2003 also. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but you forgot about this yeah. one thing. It's really important yeah. to me. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, got it, got it. Uh, but this is more about the nature of what would come to mind when future grandkids ask us what we remember about the Iraq War, and particularly drawing from our own blogs. Yes. I have to confess that I didn't blog as much about the Iraq War as someone else who did not have three children under uh. six, and two of them in diapers, and one of them diagnosed with autism in 2002. So, yeah, I was a bit preoccupied, but I was still outraged. My first post ever was Election Day 2004 from Birmingham, Alabama, where I lived. And I noted on my new blog that 21 Republicans ran unopposed on the Shelby County, Alabama ballot. And my first post, uh, I'm coming up on a blogiversary, actually, was in April of 2005. I've been a commenter for about a year before that at other blogs. Uh, But by that time, the Iraq war had been raging for about two years, and George W. Bush had been reelected. Yay. So let's start with some dates. Um, After a year of aggressively propagandizing the lie that there's some link between Iraq and the terrorist attacks of 9-11, the Bush administration launched the illegal and unprovoked invasion of Iraq on March 20th, 2003, 20 years ago. Now, a few days before the invasion... A group called the Dixie Chicks, who have since changed their name to The Chicks, publicly criticized George Bush. They were almost immediately blacklisted by most country radio stations in this country. They received many death threats, and they were criticized by other country musicians. The backlash damaged the sale of their music and their concert tickets and lost them their corporate sponsorships. By April of 2003, April of 2003, David Brooks of the Weekly Standard was confidently announcing that the war was over and that the dirty, America-hitting liberals who had doubted George Bush would now go down as the greatest dupes and idiots in history. On May 29th, 2003, Tom Friedman appeared on the Charlie Rose Show to explain why America was right to invade Iraq. Many of you probably remember the punchline of that interview, suck on this. Mm Mm-hmm. But the question that Rose asked that opened the door should be equally memorable. Quote, now that the war is over and there's some difficulty with the peace, was it worth doing? Unquote. There it was again, this fantasy that once Saddam Hussein and a few of his henchmen were knocked off, the war was over. Friedman's answer is now part of the official top five. Why hasn't this asshole been fired? moments of the war, that we needed to quote, and this is Tom Friedman again, quote, take out a very big stick right in the heart of that world and burst that bubble, unquote. Friedman made it clear that he didn't care which country we invaded and stomped on. Could have been Pakistan, could have been Saudi Arabia, it didn't matter. All that mattered was, quote, American boys and girls going house to house from Basra to Baghdad and basically saying, Which part of this sentence don't you understand? You don't think we care about our open society? You think this bubble fantasy, we're just going to let it grow? Well, suck on this, unquote. 
So let's talk about all the insane assumptions and assertions being made by pro-war mouthpieces, both in and out of the government. First, that we would be greeted as liberators. Absolutely. There was yep. never a doubt about that. This was Dick Cheney on Meet the Press, which was his favorite place to go. Mm -hmm. Tim Russert never questioned his honesty. No, and, and Dick Cheney, off the record, um, said that he loved going on Meet the Press because it was so easy to basically catapult the propaganda on that show. Exactly. The good he old days. something to the New York Times. Yeah. And then on, on Friday and then on Sunday, go on Meet the Press and credit the New York Times for their scoop. Yeah. Yep. Uh, he was a very good propagandist. Mm -hmm. So Dick Cheney on Meet the Press said, uh, the Middle East expert Professor Fouad Ajami predicts that after liberation, the streets in Basra and Baghdad are sure to erupt in joy. Tim Russert, do you think the American people are prepared for a long, costly and bloody battle with significant American casualties? Cheney, uh, I don't think it's likely to unfold that way, Tim, because I really do believe we will be greeted as liberators. And this was Assistant Secretary of Defense Paul Spitcomb Wolfowitz in 2002, testifying before Congress, quote, These are Arabs, 23 million of the most educated people in the Arab world, who are going to welcome us as liberators, unquote. Yeah. Uh, the second insane assumption was that the war would really cost very little, maybe next to nothing when you think about it. This was dandy Don Rumsfeld on This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Rumsfeld, quote, the Office of Management and Budget estimated the cost of this war would be something under $50 billion. George Stephanopoulos, you know, outside estimates say up to $300 billion. Rumsfeld, baloney. And it was the aforementioned Paul Wolfowitz's testimony before the House Appropriations Committee on March 27th, 2003, when he said, quote, there's a lot of money to pay for this. It doesn't have to be U.S. taxpayer money. And it starts with the assets of the Iraqi people. We're dealing with a country that can really finance its own reconstruction and relatively soon, unquote. Third, the American people could rest assured that this was all planned out by professionals. And who was the professional telling you all of this? Don Rumsfeld. Quote, the task of war planners is to plan for every conceivable contingency. And they are doing that from the most pessimistic to the most optimistic. Unquote. Also, Donald Rumsfeld, quote, you can be sure the United States isn't going to do anything that it's not capable of doing. And if we do something, we'll be capable of doing it. That is so Don Rumsfeld. It really is. You had to be there, and it was so <laughs> awful. Uh, the fourth ludicrous assumption was that we didn't need to worry because we really wouldn't need that many troops to do this. Um, on February 25th, 2003, General Eric Shinseki, who was then the chief of staff of the U.S. Army, testified before the Senate Armed Services Committee that, quote, several hundred thousand soldiers would be needed to secure post-war Iraq. Several hundred thousand. Several days later, the aforementioned Paul Wolfowitz cut Shinseki's legs out from under him by saying, quote, some of the higher end predictions that we've been hearing recently, such as the notion that it will take several hundred thousand U.S. troops to provide stability in post uh, Saddam Iraq are wildly off the mark, unquote. And fifth, we could all sleep easy because the war would be over in a month or two. This was Bill Crystal on C-SPAN, March 28, 2003, quote, Whatever else you can say about this war, George Bush is not fighting this like Vietnam. It's going to be a two-month war, not eight years, unquote. All of this was wrong, starting with the insane decision to disband the Iraqi military and send hundreds of thousands of trained Iraqi soldiers home with no hope, no future, and no way to support their families, one disastrous Bush administration edict after another doomed Iraq to a future of bloody chaos. Year after year of escalating insurgent attacks and factional fighting, with American troops stranded in the middle of it without enough of anything to stop it. And a Republican administration and conservative media that continually lied about the situation. There were massive ammo dumps all over the country that were left unguarded because Bush didn't send anywhere near enough troops to guard the place. 
because the whole neocon theory of Iraq was that once Saddam Hussein and 50 of his top guys were gone, democracy would spontaneously flourish. So as the whole country was looted, American troops stood guard over the oil ministry, because that was what was of primary importance to Dick Cheney. Because word had come down from the Bush administration to the commanders on the ground that looting wasn't their problem. They were there to take out Saddam Hussein and his deputies and then leave. Stuff happens, Donald Rumsfeld said. Freedom is untidy. Yeah. So let's take a look at two very different writers who were writing about the Iraq war at exactly the same time. First, we have Mr. David Brooks from April 28, 2003. Brooks was then the managing editor of the Weekly Standard under fellow neocon war pimp Bill Crystal. And in this cover article, he spends thousands of words praising the genius of George W. Bush and shitting on liberals as the worst, lowest, stupidest, most unpatriotic scum God ever created. It's a very long article, and I'm just going to give you the first paragraph. George Orwell was a genuinely modest man, but he knew he had a talent for facing unpleasant facts. That doesn't seem, at first glance, like much of a gift. But when one looks around the world, one quickly sees how rare it is. Most people nurture the facts that confirm their worldview and ignore or marginalize the ones that don't. Unable to achieve enough emotional detachment from their own political passions to see the world as it really is. You know, like David Brooks does all the time. (laughs) Now that the war in Iraq is over, we'll find out how many people around the world are capable of facing unpleasant facts. For the events of recent months confirm that millions of human beings are living in a dream palaces. To use Faud Ajami's phrase, they're living with versions of reality that simply do not comport with the way things are. They circulate and recirculate conspiracy theories, myths, and allegations with little regard for whether or not those fantasies are true. And the events of the past month have exposed them as the falsehoods that they are. Yep, liberal scum going to pay through the teeth for all the nasty things they're saying about George Bush. And then there was the late Steve Gilliard, who didn't write for the Weekly Standard, but was (laughs) writing on his blog on April 3rd, 2003. Quote, Iraq is a place where outcomes matter. In 1920, two years after World War I, a nationwide rebellion erupted, and when asked, they're still mad at the British for invading and staying. In 1991, the minute Saddam looked on the ropes, the knives came out. Now, we've created a black hole of a power vacuum. There's no one close to running the country. The army is gone. The Baathists are dying by the bucket load. The various factions are waiting to claim their stake. Yet I'm reading articles crowing about how well the war went. The problem is that deposing Saddam is like dumping the czar in 1917. Just because you establish a democratic government doesn't mean Kerensky is going to stay in power. If you had said in 1916 that the U.S. would be in Russia until 1920 fighting communists, you would have been deemed a madman. Just because Saddam was an evil bastard doesn't mean his methods were ineffective. He kept control of a country with millions of guns and two active factions not dedicated to the territorial integrity of the country. He killed a lot of people to remain in power. The U.S. does not have this option. The war alone has ruined the credibility of the U.S. in the Arab world. Saddam's methods are not available. The U.S. war against Saddam may soon be over. But that may be only the start of the Iraq war. There are millions of guns, rockets, and mortars, billions of rounds of ammo scattered around the country. No one knows who controls them or what they have planned. The Shia want control of their destiny, as do the Kurds, and the Sunnis may not be happy to lose power, unquote. Now, guess which one of these men was right, and guess which one got a job for life at the New York fucking Times? I know the answer to that question, Dirk Glass. It's a trick question. (laughs) Yep. Now let's jump to September of 2003. Here is David Brooks again, who has by this time parlayed his rabid pro-war stance into that job for life at the New York Times. Spoiler! Mm Yeah. Quote, the quintessential new warrior scans the web for the confirmation of the president's villainy. 
He avoids facts that might complicate his hatred. He doesn't weigh the sins of his friends against the sins of his enemies, but about the president, he will believe anything. He believes Ted Kennedy when he says the Iraq war was a fraud cooked up in Texas to benefit the Republicans politically. Well, it was, though. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Turns out it was. Turns out it was. Going on with David Brooks. It feels so delicious to believe it. And even if somewhere in his mind he knows it doesn't quite square with the evidence, it's important to believe it because the other side is vicious. So he must be, too. Unquote. Yes. Mm -hmm. But here is Brooks's New York Times colleague, Paul Krugman, also writing about Iraq in September of 2003. Quote, it's official. The administration that once scorned nation building now says that it's engaged in a modern version of the Marshall Plan. But Iraq isn't post-war Europe, and George W. Bush definitely isn't Harry Truman. Indeed, while Truman led this country in what Churchill called the most unsorted act in history, the stories about Iraqi reconstruction keep getting more sordid. And the sordidness isn't, as some would have you believe, a minor blemish on an otherwise noble enterprise. Cronyism is an important factor in our Iraqi debacle. It's not just that Reconstruction is much more expensive than it should be. The really important thing is that cronyism is warping policy. By treating contracts as prizes to be handed to their friends, administration officials are delaying Iraq's recovery with potentially catastrophic consequences. Meanwhile, several companies with close personal ties to top administration officials have begun brazenly offering their services as facilitators for companies seeking Iraqi business. The former law firm of Douglas Faith, the Pentagon undersecretary who oversees Iraq construction, has hung out its shingle. So has another company headed by Joe Alba, who ran the Bush-Cheney campaign in 2000 and ran FEMA until a few months ago. And a third entrant, we're not making this up, by the way, no, is nope. run by Ahmed Chalabi's nephew. Yeah, Ahmed Chalabi was going to be the savior of Iraq, according to John McCain and Joe Lieberman and all mm -hmm. the rest of the Iraq war. He was going to save them all personally. Yep. This is more of Paul Krugman. There's a moral here. Optimists who expect the administration to get its Iraq policy on track are kidding themselves. Think about it. The cost of occupation is exploding, and military experts warn that our army is dangerously overcommitted. Yet officials are still allowing Iraqi reconstruction to languish and the disaffection of the Iraqi public to grow while they steer choice contracts to their friends. What makes you think they will ever change their ways? Unquote. On November 20th, 2004, I blogged about a WAPO article concerning, quote, corruption at the Pentagon? You're kidding. This is from the Washington Post. Senator John McCain said top Air Force officials have recently been trying to, quote, delude the American people, unquote, into believing that a single person is responsible for misconduct in the $30 billion leasing plan, namely Darlene A. Druyan, the Air Force contracting official who pleaded guilty two months ago to overpricing tankers as a parting gift to Boeing before she became one of the firm's executives. I simply cannot believe that one person acting alone can rip off taxpayers out of billions of dollars, said McCain, who said he will keep pursuing internal Defense Department and Bush administration communications until, quote, all the stewards of taxpayers' funds who committed wrongdoing are held accountable. And we're all still holding our breath for that to happen. Yeah. <laughs> so so when you think of the corruption of the Trump administration. Trump yeah, what do you think of it? Where'd that come from? Trump is a piker. Trump <laughs> is small potatoes compared to the tens, hundreds of billions of dollars that the Bush administration cronies ripped this country off from um, as they let Iraq sink into chaos and, and madness. And this would be the pattern from then on. Iraq collapsing further and further into chaos while American companies with friends in the White House would prosper more and more from the oceans of money the Bush administration was now dumping into Iraq. Does anybody remember that one of the first orders issued by the Coalition Provisional Authority was that Iraq was now going to have, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, Steve Forbes, a flat tax. Yes, 
That was one of their big projects. We're going to have a flat tax in Iraq, and that'll set things right. This is from the Washington Post, November 2nd, 2003. Quote, U.S. Administrator Imposes Flat Tax System on Iraq. The flat tax, long a dream of economic conservatives, is finally getting its day, not in the United States, but in Iraq. It took L. Paul Bremer, the U.S. Administrator in Baghdad, no more than a stroke of his pen on September 15th to accomplish what eluded the likes of publisher Steve Forbes, Representatives Jack Kemp and Richard Armey, and Senator Phil Graham over the course of a decade and two presidential campaigns. It's extremely good news, said Grover Norquist, head of the Americans for Tax Reform and a Bush administration ally. Bremer's vaguely worded edict leaves open the possibility that Iraqis could face different levels of taxation below 15%, but, quote, they told me it's a flat rate, and it appears as though it's a flat rate, Norquist said. The tax fighter added, it might be a hint for the rest of us. Bremer's new economic policy for Iraq will slash Saddam Hussein's top tax rate for individuals and businesses, from 45 to 15 percent. And here comes the punchline. Of course, since, since Hussein's government, like others in the Middle East, almost never enforced tax collection, there's no real history of paying taxes in the country. Unquote. <laughs> yep. You also had directorships of major government ministries going to Bush campaign contributors with no experience who could not speak the language. One position was given to a major donor's kid on the strength of them being anti-abortion. And then there was the case of the $12 billion in American taxpayer money that just up and vanished like a fart in a firestorm. This is from Common Dreams of February 2007. And I'm sure you and I both blogged about this extensively, but this sums it up really well. Quote, this week we were treated to the spectacle of former U.S. civilian overlord of Iraq, Ambassador L. Paul Bremer, squirming in the hot seat as he attempted with little success to explain what he did with 363 tons of newly printed, shrink-wrapped $100 bills he had flown to Baghdad. He said that a lot of the cash was delivered to ministries of the Iraqi government to meet payrolls that were patently fraudulent. The Department of Defense's Special Investigator General for Iraq, Stuart Bowen, said that a 2005 audit he conducted found that in some ministries, the payroll was padded up to 90% ghost employees people who didn't really work there or perhaps didn't really exist at all. Bremer said that he decided to provide the money to meet those payrolls, even though he knew they were bogus, for fear of starting riots and demonstrations among Iraqis, real and imagined. I can think of no period in American history when we sat idly by while $12 billion just disappeared, poof, without a paper trail, without heads rolling, and without someone going to prison, unquote. The plan all along was to use Iraq as a sandbox where Republicans could play around with their stupidest, craziest ideas free from oversight and regulation, all while making their friends crazy rich. But that's not how it worked out. No. In April of 2004, ABC News' Nightline announced that it would devote one evening's broadcast to reading the names of more than 500 U.S. servicemen and servicewomen who had been killed in action in Iraq up to that point. The Sinclair Broadcasting Group, which owns several ABC affiliates, announced that it was refusing to air this broadcast because they believed it was a political stunt to undermine George W. Bush. What they didn't say was Sinclair Broadcasting Group was a political stunt to pump up George W. Bush. Yeah. In 2004, the first photographs out of America's Abu Ghraib torture site began to hit the media, and the reaction from the Republican leadership and conservative media followed the sickeningly predictable pattern. First, denial. Flat denial. Second, minimizing. Just a few bad apples. Third, redefining the word torture so that it no longer applies to what the public was seeing. That, that's not torture. Fourth, insisting that whatever it was, it was no big deal. Waterboarding, that's just a little water on your face. That's nothing. And finally, once the lying and deflection and minimizing failed, came the bragging. Hell, yes, we waterboard them. We had to, to save America. Why do you hate America? I blogged about Abu Ghraib on Thanksgiving weekend 2005. I noted that with Abu Ghraib, tis evil we are fighting here, folks. We're on, nay, we have been blessed with a mission 
to destroy these lying, torturing, self-interested evildoers. Wikipedia notes that the documents popularly known as the torture memos came to light a few years later. These documents, prepared in the months leading up to the 2003 invasion of Iraq by the United States Department of Justice, authorized certain, quote, enhanced interrogation techniques, unquote, generally held to involve torture of foreign detainees. The memoranda also argued that international humanitarian laws, such as the Geneva Conventions, did not apply to American interrogators overseas. Several subsequent U.S. Supreme Court decisions, including Hamadan v. Rumsfeld, 2006, have overturned Bush administration policy, ruling that the Geneva Conventions do apply. John Yu, the author of these torture memos, is now the Emanuel Heller Professor of Law at the University of California at Berkeley, a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and an occasional Fox News contributor. This year, 2023, John Yu appeared on Trey Gowdy's Fox News program to note that, yes, Biden had classified documents at his house, and Trump had more documents than Biden, but the greatest criminal act of all is Hillary Clinton's private email server. I also noted on Thanksgiving 2005 that Halliburton made over $2 million each and every day in profit during that time. Every day, even Sundays and holidays, and they're working for you. And the entire administration is working for them. Yeah. Why, why do you hate America, Blue Gal? I hate, I hate <laughs> Halliburton. Why, why would Obama leave Blue Gal? <laughs> this dragged on for years, getting worse every week. And by 2007, it was clear that the Iraq war was every bit the catastrophic failure that its critics had warned about, for all the reasons its critics had warned about. Uh, in 2007, July, the documentary No End in Sight was released. It, I went to go see it in the theater. It is a damning eyewitness account of the Bush administration's corruption, incompetence, and lies. Now, the important part was this is all stuff we knew, but now it had been confirmed. That film went on to be nominated for a slew of awards, including the Academy Award and the Writers Guild of America Award for Best Documentary. It's on IMDb. You can look it up and watch it today and still has a 96% audience rating on Rotten Tomatoes. A few days before No End in Sight was released, another documentary dropped. You might not have seen this one. This was seven and a half minutes long, released on YouTube. It's not on IMDb and never got nominated for anything. Uh, by 2007, the United States had been in Iraq for four years and over 3,000 American troops had died and there was no end in sight. This documentary was called Generation Chicken Hawk, and it's just Max Blumenthal walking around the Sheridan National Hotel across the street from the Arlington National Cemetery and asking college students, college Republicans, at the College Republican National Convention why they hadn't joined the army yet. All of them had internalized the GOP talking point that we needed to fight them over there so we wouldn't have to fight them over here. Because that's how you smack down those awful America-hating liberals when they criticize the war. But not one of them had any appetite for going themselves. You know, personal responsibility and all that. And the excuses these smug, dime-store Ben Shapiro's had were every bit as awkward and pathetic as you would imagine. I feel I can better serve my country in my father's accounting firm as a paid yes. intern. You know, I have a little bit of asthma. Um, <laughs> I have a knee injury. I played football. I think staying here running for office is how I can best serve. All while your girlfriend's screaming, you know, go to fight over there. Go to fight over it. And I looked up some of these guys. And they're doing fine. Some of them are selling insurance. One of them is running for local office. There's been no downside to them being these assholes in college uh, on camera. Anyway. In November 2005, I wrote my first blog post that went slightly viral. It was an annotated letter from my congressman, Spencer Bacchus, Republican of Alabama. And here's what I wrote. And Driftglass is going to help me with this one. I must have responded to one of those true majority John Kerry.com, move on, Michael Moore, please email your congressman thingies. Because yesterday I received a form letter from my congressman, Spencer Bacchus, R. Jesus Stan. His entire unedited letter is below. And I've added my response as I go. Dear insert name of constituent here, thank you for sharing with me your concerns regarding the administration's intentions on the war on terror. 
I am glad to have this opportunity to respond. You're welcome. Though I never use the term war on terror because what's going on in Iraq is, in my opinion, no such thing. The occupation of a red herring is more my style. President Bush has reaffirmed his commitment to integrity in the administration. Yeah, right. I notice Rove, Cheney, Rumsfeld, and even Brownie are still on the payroll. Nice of you, Congressman, to cancel that fundraiser you were going to have for Tom DeLay after he was booked, however. Your reaffirmation to integrity is actually more believable than the president's. Well, shortly after being indicted, little lady, Lewis Scooter Libby resigned as Vice President Dick Cheney's Chief of Staff. It's important to note that the charges Mr. Libby was indicted on are not related to intelligence manipulation. Kudos, Congressman. It takes guts to even bring this up. The average Alabama voter would buy this. I regret I neglected to tell you in my communication that I am a transplant, most recently from Massachusetts. Oh, Lordy, no! (laughs) We Bay State transplants, unlike Alabama natives, are able to get our brains around the outing a CIA operative because her husband is about to blow our cover on intelligence manipulation as being related to intelligence manipulation. Next time, I'll give you a heads up on my IQ. I do not believe President Bush manipulated intelligence to falsely allege a national security threat to the United States by Iraq. Oh, now I've got a heads up on your IQ. The administration has multiple rationales for going to war with Iraq, which is why Congress overwhelmingly supported going to war. Multiple rationales. Halliburton, Chevron, and the Saudi royal family. Congress and the American people they represent are a bunch of suckers. You forgot to mention Bush's daddy issues. Anyway, (laughs) members of the United States Armed Forces, with the help of our allies, have removed the dictator who gassed, murdered, and imprisoned his own people. So the invasion of North Korea is scheduled for when? The Iraq people have had the opportunity to vote for the first time in decades for a representative government which has inspired other democratic initiatives throughout the Middle East. Hey, too bad this didn't happen in Broward County, Florida in 2000. And the Saudi royal family doesn't look too worried last time I checked. No fair, blue gal fighting stuff has happened in my backyard. That's not fair. (laughs) It is certainly better, excuse me, it is certainly better to fight the terrorists on their territory rather than here at home. We must realize how important it is for all U.S. citizens to stand behind our men and women in uniform, as far behind them as possible, apparently, as we continue to win this war on terror. Why the fuck have we not found Osama bin Laden? Please, please get with your leadership and come up with another answer. No one buys the win the war on terror crap anymore. Over 2,000 of our troops will never get the chance to fight terrorism here at home, ever. Support the troops, bring them home. Although we may disagree on this issue. Yeah. I appreciate hearing from you. So does STB slash JB, who actually wrote and typed this letter. (laughs) I'm the Republican congressional intern gravy train, baby. Little lady, please do not hesitate to contact me in the future on this or any other issue of importance to you. Hey, Spence, consider yourself invited to bookmark my blog. Love, Blue Gal. And by October of 2005, we were all waiting for Fitzmus. Remember oh, Fitzmus, I, first class? I haven't even opened my Fitzmus gifts yet. I hope it wasn't a puppy <laughs> or something, because that would be bad. Mr. Fitzgerald was going to indict the entire Bush administration as far Started. as the liberal blogosphere was concerned. Starting with Karl Rove. He was going to be right. perp in like he two gonna days. He was going to get an indictment. Yeah, definitely going to happen. But as mentioned in Spencer Bacchus's letter, quite boldly, Scooter Libby took the fall. From the Washington Post, Vice Presidential Advisor I. Lewis Scooter Libby Jr. resigned Friday, October 28th, after being charged with obstruction of justice, perjury, and making a false statement in the CIA leak investigation, a politically charged case that would throw a spotlight on President Bush's push to war. At that time, I blogged about a Nancy Pelosi press conference. Question, to follow up on the other question about the agenda, when do you think we might be able to get an idea about the Democrats' agenda that you were talking about? Speaker Pelosi said, when we are ready to do so, as I said, It would be helpful if there were no arrests, subpoenas, or indictments on whatever day it is. We would like a clear shot at it. 
It's a legitimate concern. Yeah. God bless her. And now, Poetry Corner with I, Lewis Scooter Libby Jr. As reported by NPR, this is a note that Lewis Libby sent to Judith Miller, lying, perjuring Judith Miller of the New York Times upon her release from prison. <clears throat> you went to jail in the summer. It is fall now. Out west, where you vacation, the Aspens will already be turning. They turn in clusters because their roots connect them. Come back to work. Come back to life. Unquote. And this letter piqued the interest of the explainer team at the online magazine Slate. Here is Slate's Andy Bowers to answer the question, do the leaves of the aspen trees really turn in clusters because their roots connect them? Andy Bowers reports, no, they don't. <laughs> in this country, the longest lasting and most toxic downstream effects of Bush's Iraq debacle can be found in what it did to our media and to our politics and our culture. And I'd like to start that conversation with a story of the Itis family of Wellsburg, Iowa, which I blogged about in May of 2007. This is Mike Itis and his son Josh, who were shipping out for Iraq on the same day in March of 2007. And all of this first part is from a 60-minute interview that was done at the time. First, there's some voiceover. Down the road in Wellsburg at the Itis home, it's a father and a son, Mike and Josh, who are shipping out together. I feel that God led me to do this work, says Mike Itis, who had been on this job for 20 years and is a full-time guardsman. At the time of the interview, Itis was 49 years old and was going on his first combat deployment to Iraq. What are your thoughts about the Iraq war? What does it mean to you? Interviewer Scott Pelley asks. Well, I believe that I'd rather be in their country, keeping them turned down or from coming to America. What they did on 9-11 is a travesty, Mike Itis says. You draw the line from 9-11 through Iraq to the present day, Pelly asks. I do, he replies. Then there's more voiceover. Mike Itis and his son Josh used to be on the same page. This is Scott Pelly. I have the sense that you guys don't see eye to eye on the war. Mike Itis, that would be a true statement. Pelly. There's a difference of opinion, Josh. Come on, tell me what you're thinking. This is Josh now. I just feel we'll be there a long time. And it's going to take a lot more time than what people think back home to fix what's going on over there. From what I see, they don't want us there. Pelly asks Mike, Mike, you disagree with that? Mike Idis says, yeah, I believe that we're supposed to be over there. Progress is being made. If you go back to 9-11 and what the people did there, and when the president asked, do you want me to go after these people, the whole United States stood up in unison and said, yes, we do. He says, this is going to be a long and drawn out. Are you sure you're really going to stand with me? And they said, yes, we will. And then Mike Itis continues, well, now some aren't, because the American people are a gimme people, and give it to me now. Scott Pelley, you're a little bit angry that the folks at home have turned against the war. Mike Itis, you could say that. Scott Pelley, more than a little bit. Mike Itis, well, as I said, I believe in what we're doing, unquote. Now, this is my blog of that interaction. Conservative hypocrites simultaneously invent and violate so many ridiculous rules about who gets to be the good American in the good American clubhouse that it's hard to keep track anymore. For example... Anyone who screened for Bill Clinton's blood over trivia was just a good American who loved the rule of law. But anyone who even faintly questions any of the myriad, grossly illegal, mendacious, sleazy, imbecilic, or simply evil things W has done is obviously deranged and hates America. Anyway, for you kids out there thinking that becoming big-time journalists would be a great career move, you might be asking yourself, if I were Scott Pelley, What's the first question I would ask of Mr. Itis? Perhaps a friendly roundabout question like, did you take a big bus or a little bus to Iraq? <laughs> or a medical question like, have you perhaps sustained head trauma that has severely damaged your higher reasoning centers? Or a blunt question like, where in the wide, wide world of sports did you ever get a hold of such a stupid fucking idea? None of which Scott Pelley came even close to asking, which is a shame because there is no room left for polite, stilted, fainting couch reportage on the likes of Mr. Itis of Iowa anymore. Which itself is terribly sad because I'm quite sure he's a church-going, family-centric, straight-arrow guy. Raised nice kids, worked hard his whole life, 
good neighbor who'd lend you his chainsaw and show you how not to lose a finger using it. And that he volunteers to stand between you and me and harm is damn noble. No kidding. Which is why it is so sad that his indefensibly idiotic opinions render all of these good points irrelevant. 2004 was a watershed year for a lot of people. I know, myself included, 2004 didn't radicalize us in any sense. Most of the people I'm thinking about haven't changed their politics much in like the last decade or two, but it volatilized us, or maybe it volumized us. We started using the word fuck a lot more, and a lot more loudly, as in, what the fuck are these morons thinking? Can't they fucking read? Can't they fucking rub two facts together and get anything but baffled? Oh, and who the fuck are these undecided freaks who, three weeks before the most important fucking election of this generation, can't make up their fucking minds? You know, like that. It was when legions of us finally looked the Mike Itises of this country square in the face and realized that being polite and forgiving and Christian and tolerant and coolly rational to the generation of red staters who learned everything they know from suckling on the Limbaugh Falwell teat had completely failed. Mike Itis is the abyss into which the election of 2004 made so many of us stare into the eyes of someone whose opinion is so wrong, simply, lethally, utterly wrong, and who is dug into that opinion so deep, who is so morally and psychologically invested in the lies his dear leader has told him to dance him off the cliff that he cannot change his mind, that he dare not change his mind. Instead, he finds an entire well-financed fascist propaganda infrastructure more than happy to keep spoon-feeding him comforting deception, that the real problem is, quote, the American people are a gimme people, unquote. The real problem is the dirty hippies. The real problem is the liberal press who won't print all of that good news from Iraq. No, Mr. Itis, the real problem is that Iraq and the Iraqis had nothing, nothing, nothing to do with 9-11. The real problem is that your dear leader lied to you repeatedly and knowingly. The real problem is that your dear leader built an entire bullshit bridge between the war he got on 9-11 and the war he and his neocon vultures wanted and then cold-bloodedly pimped your grief and your fear and your patriotism to stampede you across that bridge. The real problem is that you and millions like you aren't strong enough to face the truly terrifying truth that most of what you believe about the wider world is bullshit and that the people you trusted to lead your country are liars and made you their chump. And now you're just a heavily armed patsy in the wrong country for the wrong reason, killing the wrong people on the orders of treacherous cowards and thugs who have used you as cannon fodder for their imperial ambitions and for whom you no doubt proudly voted twice. The real problem is that in the name of holy balance, journalists treat the patently and dangerously delusional adherents of the cult of W as if their opinions were worthy of discussion. Except what Mr. Idis still dogmatically believes that we're in Iraq because of what they did on 9-11 is not a matter of opinion any more than a fanatical insistence on the flatness of the earth or the falseness of the Holocaust. These are matters of historical and scientific fact. And those who insist otherwise do not have opinions. They have delusions. And now your delusions come with one of the biggest fucking price tags in American history. One that we will be paying down for generations to come. Which is why those delusions no longer deserve anyone's respectful attention or any cravenly obsequious treatment by journalists in the name of balance. The real problem is simply the journalists don't have the nerve to ask the true believers in the cult of W simple questions about their radical, ruinous, and unshakable beliefs. The real problem is that the people who believe, as Mr. Itis does, are dangerously irrational. And the people who make a fat living propping up Mr. Itis's dangerously irrational beliefs are depraved scum. For the last 30 years, many of us on the left remained politely and tolerantly silent on these subjects when we should have been loud and rude and demanding to know why dangerous, stupid, racist, or crazy people keep getting treated with deference by the lords of the media. Why people who are always wrong all the time about everything keep getting invited back into the national spotlight to share more of their idiotic insights, 
and people who have a track record for actually getting it right about Bush and Iraq and a hundred other things are treated like kooks. Why, when our country has been handed over to perverts and fascists by imbeciles and Christopaths, and our press has collapsed into a pile of toadying hair, our treasury has been pissed away by criminals, and your military hobbled by cowards and fanatics, it is somehow beyond the fucking pale to get angry about it. The reason we are in Iraq, Mr. Itis, isn't that it was necessary to be, quote, in their country, keeping them turned down or coming from America. No one in Iraq had any intention of attacking us. The reason we are in Iraq, Mr. Itis, is because millions of ignorant, fear-addled, gospel-according-to-rush, revenge-hungry, Bush-worshipping fools, and the media that caters to them. In other words, the reason we are in Iraq, Mr. Itis, is you. And what 2004 changed for us is that no matter what, you can forget about us ever politely skirting around that ugly fact ever again. After a post like that, Drift Class, I always needed a cigarette and I don't smoke. Yeah. <laughs> and that was quite frequent during those years of Drift Class's blog. <laughs> and, and you know, again, not to underscore my writing or anything like that, this was 2007. This yeah. is before... This is before Trump. This is before Obama. This was before the Tea Party, any of that stuff. And all of the things that we are mad about now were reekingly obvious then. The Mm -hmm. the complicity of the Mm -hmm. press, the insanity of the base, the willingness of the Fox News to lie people into doing disastrous things. It was all right out in front of us. It it just reminds me so much of, uh, I think it was like 2019, a woman on a college campus screaming at protesters and losing her mind and screaming, 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 and it went viral. And all of a sudden people realized, wait a minute, that is an average Trump voter that has been on a CNN panel multiple times. (laughs) Oh, 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 a person just like yourself. Yeah, Mm -hmm. no. And it turns out that she was a birth certificate nut during the during Obama's years. Yeah. Whatever happened to Orly Tates anyway? Yeah. No, this is the thing. In 2004, the American public was presented reports by the Senate Intelligence Committee and the heads of the Iraq Survey Group, David Kay and Charles Dwelfer, chosen by the president, which concluded that before the war, Iraq had neither weapons of mass destruction nor even a significant program for developing them. Mm -hmm. This is about as cut and dried as facts ever get. Nonetheless... 72% of Bush supporters continued to hold the view that Iraq had actual WMD, 47%, or a major program for developing them, 25%. These were Sean Hannity viewers. Yep, absolutely. Republican-based voters, yep. And the pattern on al-Qaeda is similar. 75% of Bush supporters think the Bush administration is currently saying Iraq was providing substantial support to al-Qaeda. 56%, or even that it was directly involved in 9-11. By this time, it was 19%, but it was 19%. Yeah, yep. Furthermore, 55% of Bush supporters said that it was their impression the Bush administration is currently saying the U.S. has found clear evidence Saddam Hussein was working closely with Mm al-Qaeda. Not saying clear evidence found, 37%. Now, Consider the same exact political party, but 18 years later in 2022. This is from Pointer News. Roughly 70% of Republicans don't see Biden as the legitimate winner. Surveys by different pollsters show virtually the same results, with the exception of a Washington Post University of Maryland poll that dropped it to 61%. Focus groups have shown that Trump supporters were not swayed by specific pieces of evidence that rebutted his claims. Sarah Longwell, executive director of Republicans for the Rule of Law, has conducted regular focus groups with fans of Donald Trump. For many of Trump's voters, the belief that the election was stolen is not a fully formed thought, Longwell wrote April 18th for The Atlantic. They know something nefarious occurred, but can't easily explain how or why. What's more, they're mystified and sometimes angry that other people don't feel the same. Mm -hmm. Not only does accurate information fail to persuade, Longwell said the effort can backfire. A woman from Arizona told me, quote, I think what convinced me more that the election was fixed 
was how vehemently they have said it wasn't, Longwell said. Yeah. So that party has been that party for a goddamn long time. And if you didn't live through it, the Iraq years, and weren't on the receiving end of the brutally repressive atmosphere during that time, it's actually nowadays kind of hard to accurately describe how unleashed the right was and how ruthless the attacks on anyone who opposed them were. Uh, It was all the time, every day. To be a critic meant you were automatically a pariah. And we all had to learn to live with that. And we learned to huddle together for protection and support. We built a blogger community. Every day you found your beliefs attacked and smeared as unpatriotic or un-American. And the poison of those attacks filtered right down into our day-to-day lives. They affected our friendships and how we carried ourselves at work and even casual conversations. It also laid the groundwork for all the political disasters to come by training the Republican base that it was now not only perfectly acceptable, but morally righteous and politically and financially rewarding to openly hate Democrats. Not just to disagree with our policies, but to despise us as irredeemable America-hating scum. So what do you suppose happened when the truth about what a disaster Iraq had been from the start finally began to leak out? What happened to all the politicians and all the pundits who had been so sure about the righteousness of their cause and the villainy of the left? What happened to Mark Thiessen, John Yu, Max Boot, Jonah Goldberg, every single person at the National Review? What happened to the Cheneys? What happened to Tom Friedman, Bill Kristol, Paul Wolfowitz? Well, he got a job at the World Bank until yeah. he screwed that up, you know, rubbing his junk up against the Whatever happened to David Brooks? Yeah, whatever happened to that guy? <laughs> what happened to that guy? Yeah. The list is endless, and the answer is nothing happened. Nothing at all. One of the themes of our No Fair Remembering Stuff podcast is how easy it is to erase and rewrite history when you control the cameras and the microphones. The overwhelming majority of Iraq war boosters never apologized and never suffered any professional consequences. You all have your opinions about the war and, and the aftermath. You, a lot of you probably went through it with us. Many of, Some of you served. Yeah, some of you served. Many of the people we know are veterans um, and support this podcast and support our blogs. Uh, but it really is wild to go back and look at all the people who were, who were just unhinged and they finally got a free fire zone. They finally got to just shit on liberals with no consequences and they just went for it. And those people all got proved to be wrong and they all got promoted. And the Iraq war just faded into the background and all those people just were went right on with their business. And all of us who were right, we're still pariahs. <laughs> we're still awful scum. And the base has this is why we refer to them as reprogrammable meat bags, because you can just tell them anything you want, and a month later tell them the opposite, and they'll just believe anything that Sean Hannity tells them, anything Tucker Carlson tells them. And that's why they're so goddamn dangerous, and that's why we do this, because remembering this stuff as it actually happened and the effect it has on our present politics is terribly important and something that not enough people are willing to do. Don't forget, we're always looking for more Patreons to make this podcast fly. So if you can afford to support us in that way, please do so at patreon.com forward slash proleftpod. And thank you for that. See you next time. See you next time. The Professional F Podcast No Fair Remembering Stuff Tuesday edition is produced under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2022-23, DGBG Productions. 